This week on The Record, a key question before the Supreme Court, can President Trump face criminal consequences? A friend of the court, former Senator Jack Danforth, is on the record. Tragedy in Kansas City, the shocking images of panic disrupting a Super Bowl celebration, renewed calls for lawmakers to do something. Senator Carla May is on the record. And in Illinois, one ally of former Speaker Mike Madigan is heading to prison, another pleading guilty. Why a judge used a reference to the mafia in his prison sentence. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. One of the most accomplished politicians in Missouri history is making a personal appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court in a case that could have major implications in this year's presidential election. The question is whether former President Donald Trump should have a shield of immunity that would protect him from criminal prosecution for his behavior on and around January 6th, that day when Congress certified the election results and initiated what was supposed to be a peaceful transfer of power. Former Senator Jack Danforth is as Republican as they come. He's credited with helping turn a reliably blue Missouri to a red state. And before he served in the Senate seat once held by Thomas Hart Benton and Harry Truman, he served as Missouri's attorney general. And he joins us now after filing this brief with the U.S. Supreme Court, warning justices not to grant Trump immunity because the legal precedent itself might invite a usurper's military coup. Senator Danforth, good to have you with us. President Trump's Thank legal you. team calls that a, quote, lurid hypothetical. What persuades yeah. you that a threat like that is real? Well, the question is whether the president is immune from any criminal prosecution from any act to interfere with a peaceful transfer of power. And this is an issue that's it's much more important than any person or any political party. It has to do with the rule of law. And specifically, it has to do with the Constitution itself, which in two different places provides that at a particular time and place, the office of the presidency is vacated Mm -hmm. and it belongs to the person who's next elected. And that is what uh, Trump tried to uh, tried to uh, prevent happening. You, you and refer to the, the allegation and in the indictment is that he did it by criminal methods. So if he could interfere with the transfer of power, uh, he could use, for example, the armed forces, as was threatened in this case, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, to seize voting machines and to use whatever power he can, and that he would be immune from uh, from uh, prosecution. It was so ultimately I think that is clearly wrong. Sure, it was ultimately unsuccessful, and people have gone to prison for their role in January sixth and around those events so far. You refer to the Constitution, and there's also federal law. In fact, your court filing acknowledges that quote existing federal criminal statutes deter a president's use of the military and armed federal agents to alter presidential election results. That's in your filing. So why would granting yeah. Trump immunity change any of that? Wouldn't any well, other co-conspirators also well, be violating he could simply, federal law? He could simply use the military or try to use the military. That was, uh, that was suggested in this case. There were people in his administration who were advocating the use of the military to seize voting machines. They could also use the military to interfere with the counting of the electoral votes. So, yeah, I mean, then the fact that there is, he, I mean, that's just the point. He would have violated statutes. The, the prosecutor and the indictment contends that he has violated criminal statutes. And now he claims, well, that's okay. I'm free to violate criminal statutes. I want to stay in power. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's another election coming up. A lot of people in Missouri are watching this year. Uh, you famously served as a mentor to Josh Hawley uh, before he became a U.S. senator and helped him defeat Claire McCaskill. That was a major pickup for Republicans in 2018. But after January 6th, you called that, quote, the worst mistake of your life. Do you want to see Josh Hawley win a second term? No, I don't. I, I was a great fan of Josh's, and uh, I still hope that I, I'm his friend. But I think what he did relating to January 6th, which was uh, just totally intolerable, it was, I mean, he went on national television and he said this election was going to be determined on January 6th. He knew that that wasn't the case. And then he went out and 
before the crowd and egged them on. So no, I think what he's done is just totally unforgivable as far as being a U.S. senator is concerned. And I, I said at the time that supporting him was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life, and I still believe that. You went so far as to try and support temporarily a third-party candidate in the 2022 Senate race. Could you see yourself go so far as to endorse or support a Democrat against Hawley? Well, you know, I'm, I am a Republican, and, and I've always been a Republican, and I believe in the principles of the Republican Party. So my hope would be that this could be resolved within the, by the Republican Party and that our party could stand by its um, historic values, uh, which include the rule of law and which include, um, for example, a strong national defense and standing by our allies and, and not going overboard with the huge deficits in the federal budget. Those are the principles of the Republican Party. I stand by them. I support them. And I, I hope that the historic Republican Party can be brought back to life and restored because it has so much to offer our country and has given so much to our country. If I can circle back to this January 6th question and your friend of the court brief that you filed there, you have a friend on the court. You've referred to Justice Clarence Thomas as a friend of yours and helped to shepherd him through the Senate Judiciary confirmation process those years ago. Some of his critics, including Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, have suggested he should recuse himself because of his wife, Jenny Thomas's personal involvement in communication with the Trump White House around that. How do you see that question? Should he recuse because of his wife's involvement or is he no, able to ha no. handle that? No, no. I, I think once you start down the road of trying to recuse people other for other than for, you know, financial reasons, if they have some financial stake in the case, of course, they would recuse themselves. But something as sort of fuzzy as this, no way. And, you know, I know Clarence Thomas very well, and he's going to make up his own mind. And he's not going to be swayed in his judicial decisions by anybody, his wife or anybody else. Senator, thank you very much for your time. We wish we could catch up with you again, hopefully soon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. A mass shooting erupting at the Chiefs Super Bowl parade. Missouri Senator Carla May joins us next. The Missouri House and Senate canceled session halfway through this last week to attend the Chiefs Super Bowl championship parade. Of course, at the time, they didn't know it would soon become the scene of America's latest mass shooting. State Senator Carla May is now on the record, and I understand that you were there at that parade. You were just telling me moments ago. What was the scene like? What was your reaction in the immediate aftermath? Well, thanks, Mark, for, you know, asking the question and, you know, starting off with this. You know, the um, it was chaos, actually, once the shooting started once everybody heard the shots and started running for safety. But before then, it was such a beautiful event. Uh, everybody was there in anticipation and in celebration of what the Chiefs had accomplished. There was a lot of sharing, taking pictures, a lot of camaraderie, kids having fun. It was a sea of red and different colors, you know, different people with different jerseys. And right at the end, when things had ended, then the um, chaos broke out. I think it's that whiplash from celebration to tragedy that yes. adds to that shock and awe factor. It also happened, as it would turn out, on Valentine's Day. It was 95 years ago, Valentine's Day, when America was horrified by news reports of a similar kind, that gang members had used Thompson machine guns to kill their rivals in cold blood in Chicago. It took five years. But eventually, Congress would take action to ban those types of guns in the National Firearms Act of 1934. It also taxed those guns, uh, subjected them to a registry. Would you expand that federal ban to include other rifles or handguns that are considered assault weapons? Yes, I think that in Missouri, you know, we can sit here and talk about um, how do we protect Missourians. And we just had a school shooting where a young man shot a teacher and a child and killed them. And the school and the children were left with that aftermath. You're referring to last year's incident? Yes, yeah. yes, visual and performing arts mm -hmm. school. Now we have a similar situation 
at what is supposed to be a festive event for the community, I think that it's time for us to take action now. We can sit and talk about you know, praying and all of that. Yes, we can always pray, but it's time for action. And Republicans have been rolling back gun laws in Missouri for over 20 years. And so you would support that at the federal level should you win a seat in the U.S. Absolutely. I was surprised to learn that the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act, which the courts have right now ruled invalid while it undergoes further judicial review, but that, that law would attempt to overturn or invalidate that federal law on machine guns in Missouri, as well as all other federal laws. That hasn't stopped federal prosecutors from still charging, convicting, and imprisoning criminals who sell or transfer machine guns uh, in, in Missouri, rather. But I guess when you consider that, that the federal law is still working to convict and catch people who would sell a machine gun in Missouri, knowing that, how then would you rate the argument we heard this week from Speaker Dean Plocker that, quote, laws alone don't solve the problem? Well, we have to start with the law in this case, and we should ask him about should these assault weapons be on the streets of Missouri? Do we need assault weapons or weapons that um, create mass destruction he or war zone weapons on the streets of Missouri? No, we need to let the constituents of Missouri decide. We need to let those individuals who are actually at the chief celebration decide if they want these type of weapons on the streets of our cities. We don't need these weapons on the street and you don't need them in rural Missouri because you don't need assault weapons to hunt. Mm -hmm. it, you're, you're getting at uh, the will of the people. Which Absolutely. Is, which is something else coming up in the Senate, in the Missouri Senate where you serve now, this question over uh, reforming the ballot process to change the Constitution. Uh, some of the so-called members of the Freedom Caucus complained that session was adjourned this week for this parade. They wanted to stay in session to make it harder to change the Constitution. Uh, you have uh, been involved more recently in this question about abortion. And, and uh, do you have any predictions for how Missouri will vote? Uh, say that they put forward this question to make it harder to change the Constitution. Well, how will voters respond to a question like that? Because they, they're going to get a chance to weigh in on it. Well, the thing about it is that the people in Missouri, especially voters, I think voters are very intelligent. And the Republicans attempt to uh, oppress their voice, meaning that the bill that they put forth, it has changed several times because, you know, they've dropped several substitutes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you want 20 percent of the voters in Missouri to overturn what 80 percent of the voters approved. I don't think that Missourians like those numbers. The one vote, one person majority should still rule in Missouri. And you're saying about abortion, whatever the issue is, because we have also initiative petition issues in reference to gun that's coming out right now. When the legislature has failed the citizens of Missouri, their recourse is the initiative petition process. Now you're trying to create voter oppression. This is voter oppression by stopping uh, regular people from having a voice. Certainly minority rule. Oh, absolutely. And you do not want minority rule. I would rather for the people to continue to cast their vote with Medicaid expansion, cast their vote with expanding medical marijuana, with expanding regular marijuana. The people ha have a right to have a voice. And if the people they elected are not doing what they were sent to the Jefferson City, to the legislature to do, the people's recourse is to recall them mm -hmm. or do initiative petition. And this is plain politics. Yeah, there's, and we could talk about this for a long time, and I would enjoy that very much. But <laughs> I, I want to ask you, too, about your race for the U.S. Senate. It, filing still hasn't opened. Are you committed to running all the way through this race in the U.S. Senate? I am committed to running all the way through the race in the U.S. Senate because we need to elevate the conversation. I am the most qualified person in this race, and I have more legislative experience than anybody running in this race, and I have a heck of a record to prove it. Let's check the record when it comes to donors, because right now Josh Hawley has raised $4.9 million. He's got almost all of that money in cash on hand. Lucas Kuntz has raised even more, $5.4 million, spent a fair chunk. He still has $2.2 million cash on hand. The last report of the FEC, you've raised less than $28,000. That's not enough to hire a campaign manager. How can you run a confident campaign if donors aren't backing you the way they're backing your opponents? Well, let's just start here. First of all, we 
all, all of that money is not coming from Missourians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a lot of that money is outstate money as well. National money. But the thing about it is, I have won campaigns before when my opponents have outraised me. On a shoestring budget? Absolutely. And I've been doing this for a very long time, and I think that Missourians are going to invest in me and my campaign once we start, you know, really getting our message out there. And I think that once they hear the message, once they understand that I'm the most qualified person in the race, and once they understand that I have more legislative experience mm -hmm. and I have a record to back it up, I, in I, Missouri. I wish we had more time. Yes. We'll be back in a minute. Uh, we crossed the river to Illinois where Tim Mapes is going to prison. We're going to look at his sentence next. This week, a New York judge denied former President Donald Trump's motion to dismiss criminal charges against him. Trump's first of four criminal trials will begin in March. He faces criminal charges in this case for falsifying business records to try and conceal paying hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels in an extramarital affair. Prosecutors say Trump orchestrated the catch and kill scheme where he would buy the rights to negative stories and bury them or pay off the sources to try and keep them quiet uh, in an attempt to influence the 2016 presidential election. The indictment says Trump used a shell company to hide those payments and filled out false documents to cover it all up under the disguise of legal services. None of those expenses were reported in his campaign fund. He has pleaded not guilty in that case. Jury selection begins March 25. In Illinois, former state Senator Sam McCann pleaded guilty this week. The Republican turned third party gubernatorial candidate pleaded guilty to wire fraud, money laundering and tax evasion. He was recently detained after disobeying court orders after a discharge from a St. Louis hospital. Former Illinois House Speaker Mike Madigan's chief of staff is headed to jail. Tim Mapes was sentenced this week to 30 months in prison. Mapes was accused of lying to a grand jury and pleaded guilty to perjury and attempted obstruction of justice. The judge, in handing down that prison sentence, told Mapes, quote, the law of omerta had no place in that grand jury room. Omerta refers to that old mafia code of silence or loyalty to the boss above all else. Madigan himself faces 23 counts of racketeering, bribery, and conspiracy in a trial that has yet to begin. He also was pleaded not guilty. Congressman Mike Boss picked up some big endorsements that span the conservative spectrum this week. The National Right to Life, the National Federation of Independent Business, the National Rifle Association, and House Republican Elise Stefanik, all backing Boss over Darren Bailey. He's also got former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, temporary Speaker designee Jim Jordan, and current Speaker Mike Johnson, all in his corner. You can find our full interview with Boss from this program last week up on KSDK.com. We've invited Bailey here for equal time. He has yet to accept our offer. We check the record next. Tomorrow is President's Day. Perhaps some of you even stayed up later with us tonight because you have tomorrow off work. But it's also primary season in a presidential election year. That means voters are looking for what's right. We expect our presidents to know a lot. Who are the right candidates advancing the right issues at the right time? So let's check the record. What happens to people who spend so much time trying to be right or trying to persuade the masses that they're right? Benjamin Franklin wrestled with this question all the way back at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. In written remarks prepared for the convention, Franklin wrote in defense of changing your mind to adapt to new information. He said, having lived long, I've experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration to change opinions, even on important subjects, which I once thought right, but found them to be otherwise. In 2024, today's voters are taking a harsh view of age in political candidates, and some of those questions, I believe, are fair. But Franklin also noticed this about age. He said, the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. Most men, indeed, as well as most sects in religion, think themselves in possession of all truth. He closed his remarks agreeing to a compromise in the Constitution. He called it near to perfection, but with some faults. Franklin said, the opinions I have had of its errors, I sacrifice to the public good. In other words, he put his country and fellow countrymen before his own opinion of himself and what he thought was right. Or, as the librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, would later put it, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. We certainly have an awful lot of information available to us today, and it can sometimes give us that illusion that maybe we know something. But are we still open to that dialogue, to hear what our neighbor thinks, to consider how they arrived there? Or do we deceive ourselves in thinking we already know it all? Perhaps, as we survey the landscape for leaders, we might look for those with equal doses of, yes, confidence in their opinion, 
and humility enough to listen to others. That does it for us this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you right back here at the same time next week. And until then, we're off the record.